and I hope all my audio levels and such are good. I've been tinkering with my OBS <clears throat> lately, so. But we are live, so I think we're up and running, and I think it's good. And people who tune into the YouTube, if there's an issue like they can't hear when I speak, they'll probably make a note in the comments. Uh, all right, so uh, I've included in the general chat the cheat sheet. I've also included this in the module. Uh, you are all who are here in the module have been promoted. You can make a copy of this. You can save a copy of this if you like. It is in the official module. And uh, what I encourage you to do is just, in fact, I might just copy this a few times. Uh, there you go. Well, wherever they end up there, they're at the end of the table. Just grab yourself a copy and um, you can just kind of thumb through it at your leisure and follow along if you like. That way, um, you know, you don't have to wait for someone to stop using the document. So um, there should be some table space. If we have to, we can clear off the memes or some of this other stuff that we don't need. Okay. All right. I'm going to open my own copy of the document. I may open the Word version because then if I need to make any changes, we're going to do that. Okay, so let's get started. Um, the K-22 system was designed to address problems that I saw in the Brigade system, which was a popular system that was simple and easy to use early on. One of the problems was that units were far too tough. They stood in combat not just for one turn, which was a 15-minute turn, but for sometimes for like two hours, and, and they just didn't break. And I found that to be ridiculously uh, ahistorical. And I wanted units that were a lot more brittle. So I came up with what I call at first the brittle system. Uh, and then it just sort of evolved over time uh, into this system. Um, this system is designed to play at a lower level than what most people are used to. So most commanders will run brigades with battalions in them. So your basic unit is going to be uh, two blocks, which is one battalion, which is just like traditional Kriegspiel. So I'm going to take these two blocks and put them out here. Here's a battalion. Okay, it's always two blocks. It's never just one block. It's two blocks. Each of these is a half battalion. Each half battalion represents 450 men. Okay, <clears throat> so it's a total of 900 men in the full battalion, basically almost a thousand. Uh, what we would call in the early Civil War a regiment would be the two blocks. All right, um, the game scale is five uh, minutes, meaning turns move in five minute increments. Again, we're playing lower. We're not commanding divisions and core where we move in 15 minute jumps. We're commanding battalions where we move in five minute jumps, okay? Uh, the scale on the map. Uh, the grid is set up on the map, but uh, the scale is basically every um, centimeter is 100 paces. There should be 400 paces for one square, and one square or 400 paces is how far a unit moves in a five-minute turn. Specifically, that means infantry in column, on road, on flat terrain. So if we flip the blocks over, we have their column side, and I'm going to put them here. And you'll see right here that this unit is on flat terrain, and they're on a road, and they're in column. There's even little trees here. You see the little trees alongside the road? So they're, they're walking down this nice shady little lane, and there are no what I call complications to their movements. There is nothing that's going to impede their their nice uh, summer's day walk down a shady lane. So they're going to move the maximum possible, which is going to be 400 paces. They're going to move from here to here in five minutes. That's one five minute turn. Okay. Now, in the event that something happens, let's say they start to go uphill. 
Well, they're going to slow down as they go uphill. That's going to reduce their movement by 25% or 100 paces. So if they're moving uphill here, they start going up this hill right here, they're only going to move 300 paces on that turn. Okay, they're only going to move to here because they're going uphill. It's a little tougher. Does it have to be precise? No, it can vary. If you give them a little bit of extra, no big deal. Nobody cares. That's within the realm of reality. Um, nobody's actually counting. Um, so that's fine. Again, there's room to fudge. Kriegspiel is the land of fudge. Uh, we might talk more about that later if, if it comes up. But for right now, uh, a pro each complication to movement reduces their movement rate by 25%. Let's say they're moving over land. They're not moving on a road. That's a 25% reduction. Let's say they're in formation and they're moving over land off the road. Does anybody want to tell me how much of a reduction that is? 50%. That's right. That's right, 50%. They're only going to move half. Okay, so whatever the complications are, the complications stack. However, they always move a minimum of 100 paces, no matter what. As long as the terrain is passable, they will always move 100 paces. So if I have them going uphill um, in line uh, and maybe it's raining or something, you know, to make it really, really difficult, they're still going to at least get 100 paces in five minutes, you know. And in reality, they'd probably even do better than that. Uh, here's a trick question. How far do they get here? They're in formation. It's raining. They're going uphill. Uh, it's a dark and stormy night. I don't know. It's just, it's really, it's just like the worst conditions for marching and maneuver that you can think of. How far do they move here? In this case, it's a trick paces. question. <laughs> What's that? A hundred? No, they don't. And the reason the terrain is not passable. You see these little notches right here on the map? That's like a cut. Oh, okay. That's a cut in the road. They have to go around that. Yes, they can move a hundred paces around it, but they are not going to move straight through it. Okay. So please remember to read the map. I've seen many occasions where you get this formation right there. I've actually seen this formation right here south of the brickworks. Um, <clears throat> no, that is not a reasonable formation because of the cut. So, you know, you can have the units uh, like this or something. You can have them out here like this. You can even say they're in an assault column and you can stack them up or whatever. That's another thing you can do. You can stack units to indicate uh, that you have an assault column or something going on. Uh, Question, on. sir. Go ahead. Is there a legend for this map? No, there's not. If the only legend on this map is me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately there isn't. But if you have a question about a feature, just ask. Mm -hmm. And the umpire right. will tell you a rule on it. So, yeah. I apologize that there's not. I don't know why there's not. But uh, I don't. maybe the Prussians weren't into it. Or it wasn't a, a thing for them. Okay. <laughs> Well, they probably used universal symbols that they all understood. So. Exactly. Yeah, it wasn't for popular consumption. It was for training. And... Okay, let's talk about combat value. There's an important concept in K-22 called combat value. I'm just going to check the YouTube real quick. Okay, I don't have anyone hollering at me there. You guys are all here. Okay, <laughs> combat value is a critical concept in K-22. Uh, infantry units come in basically three flavors. There's elite, regular, and militia. Each block has its own combat value. So that means there's a combat value here and a combat value here. Okay, let me get a little pin here to help reinforce this. Okay, if these two blocks are both regular, if they are both regular, okay, and then this block will be worth 5 CV, and this block will be worth 5 CV, and the total between them equals 10. All right, so you thought you weren't going to have to use this anymore after you got out of first grade, but no. <laughs> Where am I going to use this, teacher? 
Well, when you play Kriegspiel, you're going to need to know how to add. All right, so if you're regular, then uh, the blocks are 5 and 5. If you're militia, okay, the blocks are 4 points and 4 points, and that equals ocho, or 8. Man, it is so hard to write with the mouse. Let me grab a couple more blocks. Another convention that Damon and I came up with is that lower numbers should represent lower quality units. It's kind of a cool little inside way of knowing uh, just at a glance if you do it this way the values of the units. Okay, and now let's set up some elites. Let's say these guys here are elites. Uh, and we'll just put them out here. Okay. And all right. If we have elite, what do you guys think the combat value of the elite's going to be? 12, 6. That's six, right. Eight. 6 and 6 and then 12. Right, 8. <laughs> all right. Always a comedian, huh? All right, there we go. So there's your elites. Okay, why is this important? Well, it's important because <laughs> there's going to be a difference between the two sides that are clashing in most cases, and that then impacts the odds and the die that you roll and so on. Okay? All right, so there you go. That's how it works. You have uh, combat value. So that's combat value. I should write it up here. You know, I could type this, right? <laughs> or abbreviate it. I could just write CV. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to write CV because if somebody watching this who doesn't have the context or just looking at it, they might not know. Uh, but yeah, I was tempted to just phone it in and do CV. And I can put here in parentheses CV because I will be referring to it as CV, okay? All right, man, that looks so sloppy. That's okay. I do not have good handwriting by nature. Oh. In the sixth grade, I got a C on my report card in <laughs> handwriting, and I remember bawling my brains out at the back of the classroom. Here I was in the sixth grade, and I was bawling in the back of the classroom <clears throat> because I had a C on my report card for handwriting. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, I digress. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Okay. So, um, there are some other things in here on combat value, like the cavalry, the dragoons, the Jaeger infantry. We're not going to worry about that, okay? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple blocks here, and we're going to do a little exercise, okay? Because this is something you'll be doing quite often. This is the heart of the system, is what's called the six steps. So, you grab two blocks, and... Uh, actually, you grab however many blocks, right? But uh, let's say we have two units here, right? And both of these are uh, regular quality, okay? So what you do in the K-22 system, what speeds things along is you don't roll a die for each block. Under the brigade system, you would roll four dice here, and then you would resolve one, two, three, four die rolls, which is a lot of work. No, we're only going to roll one die. So we're going to take and we begin by grouping these units because these units are engaged with each other. They're in combat. So we group them. That's step one of the six steps is grouping. The second thing is we determine who is superior and who is inferior. So I'll just type that out here. Uh, let's see here. Superior versus inferior. All right, there we go. It would be nice if it had a little color to it, but I think there we go. All right, and let's move it off what I wrote there. Clean up my mess. All right, so you begin by grouping, okay? Now we have to decide which side of this group is superior and which side is inferior. So to do that, we need to know the combat values. So if this is regular, and this is regular. What is the uh, who, what is the combat value of each? Um, five five per block for both sides. 
Right. So, so 10, 10 and 10. 10. So the combat value between the two sides is identical. So that means that <clears throat> neither side is necessarily superior or inferior. So in that case where it's identical, and this will actually be a little uncommon, I think, um, but in, in either case where it is identical, just pick a side. And just say, well, you know, red got there first. We're just going to say red superior, or we're just going to say blue is superior. Believe it or not, it does not impact the odds unless you roll this orange die here. Okay, but we're going to roll the die and we are going to roll what I call the even money die uh, or the infantry versus infantry die. Okay, so let's see here. Let's rotate it to one so you can all see it. All right, so uh, we've declared that red will be superior. That's step two. Step three, determine which die to roll. Well, it's an infantry fight, so we're going to roll one of the two infantry die because there is no difference between the two combat values, we're going to roll the even die. Okay? All right, the even CV die. And we determine any die roll modifiers. Oh, is there anything here that would modify this combat that you can think of? Is there a terrain feature? Is there artillery support? Uh, do they have skirmish companies embedded? Uh, we didn't say that they did, so I guess not. Um, there's really nothing. Nobody's on a flank. There's no die roll modifiers here. So it's just going to be a straight roll of the dice and apply the result. Okay, so let's go ahead and roll the die. Remember, red superior. And it says inferior retreats. So that means blue is going to retreat. Okay, and then we'll be applying that consequence. Where is the... Uh, where is the list of, okay, there it is, number six, apply the results, okay? So retreat is the losing group retreats 400 paces, all units in the formation take one disruption. So he's going to fall back 400 paces. Now, here's where it gets a little philosophical. You're like, wait a minute, these guys have time to run 400 paces? Well, not really, but you can assume it's happening on the next turn or whatever. And this is one of the things I want to address in today's game, is we're going to take things like this into a little bit more account if I have enough umpires to do it. It's a little work intensive to manage. But yes, when units fall back, they'll fall back. Um, normally when you play, you just move them back immediately, and it's assumed that's happening on the next turn. Um, a lot of times, though, we let them move back for free, like this, and then we allow their commander to immediately start commanding them which means they essentially they took five minutes to get here to go 400 paces then we allow them to retreat 400 paces through a time warp and then we <laughs> allow their commander to give them orders and start moving them right away right back into the fight if they want well that's ridiculous that's not the way it should be done but it's the way we play and i want to start correcting that in the organization altogether uh, but I especially want to correct it in today's game if, if we can. But in any case, you apply the result. There are three results that are possible, okay? So let me grab uh, some more blocks here, okay? If a unit falls back, all that means is they're in this firefight here. It's a little hot for them, and they've decided, you know what? We're going to back up 200 paces. And we're going to put some range between us and the opponent. We're not retreating. We're not abandoning our position. We're simply backing up to kind of cool down the engagement because we'd rather not for whatever reason. And that's all it is. It's in good order. There's no disruption taken. If they are forced to retreat, they're going to go another 200. They're going to go a full 400 paces. And they are going to... Uh, let's see here. Let me erase this now so it doesn't confuse people. And they are going to take disruption because they had to fall back a little faster. You know, okay, so they're not in as good shape. I can't erase the text, can I? Erase all text. There you go. Okay, then of course there's routed, right? So here they are. They're fighting. We roll a routed result. They're going to go back 800 paces. You flip them over, 
because they're running away and then you apply disruption to them and one of them takes a loss. Uh, actually they take two disruptions. Let me get the disruption token again. Uh, you know I probably already have it copied but all right they're all going to take two disruptions and one of these units is going to take a loss. And the way we apply an infantry loss is we swap it out with an exchange block. This is something that they do in regular Kriegspiel. You have these five, six blocks. That's an exchange block. And it's how the Prussians showed losses. So that unit's taken losses. All right, now quiz time. What is the combat value of this particular force? Let's say immediately their commander-in-chief says, hey, the bad guys are still pushing. We've got a hold here. I know that it's a mess, but I'm going to gather every guy I can in the battalion and get them to kind of form a line here. And so they hold here. What's the combat value of this unit going to be? Would it be five and four? So they're down to nine? That's correct. They are now down to nine. Okay. Then, however, there's some crazy die roll modifiers from the disruption. One, two, three, four. That's a negative four die roll modifier. How likely are they going to survive a subsequent follow-up attack? Not very, <laughs> but but it is possible. They could make the roll. Um, so until that disruption comes off, that's a minus one die roll modifier. I actually should change these disruption tokens to indicate that. That would be a really good idea. I'll talk to Damon. Um, but that's a, each one of these is a minus one DRM. Okay? I have a quick question. So yes. does it make no difference if units are fighting at maximum range or at 100 bases? Uh, it does not make a difference the range per se. Uh, because one side will be superior, the other will be inferior, the die result will, will kind of come out. However, uh, actually there is a difference in the range. Oh, there's close range. That's right. I was gonna, I'm wrong. I forgot my own rule. I remember that I didn't like that. Um, is it on this ruler? I think it's on this ruler. Near musket range, yes, it is, it's on here. So near musket range, if they are firing under 200 paces, I believe, is what it is. Uh, yep, 200 paces, see here, near musket range. This is the fire ruler, by the way, um, or whatever. I don't know what we're calling it. Maybe it's a movement ruler. Oh, I think it's a movement ruler. This is the uh, artillery fire ruler, and it has two sides. This is your big 10, 12 pound. This is your smaller six, seven pound gun. Um, if you are under 200 paces, I think all units take disruption. Pretty sure that's what it is. Let me take a look. This is something that's gonna be covered in the regular rules. Let me pull out the rule book and get that for you. Cause I think that's an important question because it will happen. It will come up. Okay, so let me go into the official rules. And let's see here. Infantry. Uh, let's see here. Hang on, I'm looking here. I know it's in here. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go control F near. No, uh, close. There we go. Close range volley fire under combat section 11. As an optional rule, the umpire may consider fire under 200 paces to be uh, close range volley fire. So let me zoom in here. Okay. Uh, in this case, the men do not miss so easily and casualties are higher. Therefore, the effect is that both units take one disruption as long as they are exchanging fire. 
So that was an excellent question, whoever asked it. The answer is both units will take disruption um, as long as they are firing at each other under 200 paces. Okay? Are we good on that? What's the, um, what's the maximum amount of disruption a unit can have? Uh, historically, it's always been like up to four. Uh, basically, if... Um, I think four, and I don't think I have a rule on that. Um, we've always just kind of assumed you max out like at four. That's why the disruption actually has these different colors and such, but it works in reverse because this is a this is an artifact of the old brigade system. Uh, but this is the least disrupted state with three stars because that indicated the unit's quality, and then it would degrade to two to three uh, and then at the lowest state it's the white I'm just using them as markers now and I'm just just adding them together oh here's two that's two disruption uh, below <coughs> that you get into breaking shattered routed and surrendered um, so I use these as markers but it, it's clear to me that we need to address this so that's a that's a design thing i have to talk to damon who's the, de the module um the developer or designer he he tweaks this when when i need it uh and we'll we'll address that but uh, generally speaking uh if a unit goes down to combat value of zero through losses or disruption or whatever it, it's removed from play so um Disruption actually just is used as a negative DRM, though. It does not affect combat value. So there's a hole in the rule set that I need to tweak. I need to plug that hole. So thanks, Achilles. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> You're welcome. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, usually units don't get to like four disruption. And if they do, they're going to be combat ineffective. So the commander has to... That's one of the, the design... Uh, one of the elegant design features of K-22. You have to have a reserve. You have to work with your teammates. You have to have a line that's capable of holding while your, your disrupted units recover. Otherwise, you're just going to get pushed across the map. You're going to get surrendered or routed or whatever. So you absolutely have to have reserves. You can't just do what we had been doing under the brigade system, which is you make this big old huge line and both sides just slam the two lines into each other and then call it a day with no regard for casualties or reserves. That's ahistorical. So this here kind of forces you into historic play because if you go all in every hand, well, you're going to lose and then you're not going to have uh, any recourse. You're not going to have anything to recover. You're just going to lose the rest of the game. All right, so that's kind of cool to get to talk about that. Uh, let's get back into this here. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I have I have one other question for you. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> let's say, for example, this is a, a near fire uh, example uh, at less than 200, and the blue already had uh, three disruptions apiece. Mm -hmm. Then regardless of the result of the die roll, blue is going to go to their max on disruption no matter what. Uh, but let's say the die roll maxes the disruption on both sides. So essentially both sides break. Mm -hmm. Route them both. Route them both? Okay. Yeah, route them both. Here's the thing. There's always going to be situations. And in fact, this is at the very top of the cheat sheet. And it says here, a note about the rules. The rules are more like guidelines may be modified to taste. It is impossible to compose a rule for every situation. Strange things can happen. In fact, I have this here in the module one. I just look at it here in the module. Just going to go right back here. Okay. In the event the rules seem inadequate to address a situation, use your judgment as an umpire to resolve it in a manner that is reasonable and justifiable to the players. Okay. Uh, again, Fair enough. That, that's the rule, and that's why you're an umpire. <coughs> You're not just a person who's there to enforce rules. You're an umpire because you have the discretion and the judgment, the knowledge and the intellect to say, you know what, this is just ridiculous, both sides route, whatever it may be. 
So there are always going to be parts, you know, little gaps in the rules or little one-off situations that just nobody anticipated. Uh, and when that happens, just use your judgment. Very okay. good. I want to show you one more die here before we move uh, into the artillery stuff. And we're actually more than halfway through here. Uh, the, the bulk of this is kind of covered. So let me move that to rotation value one. This is the advantage die. In the event you have combat value that differs between two sides greater than two. So you see it's actually written right here on the die. If the superior has a combat value greater than two, then you roll this die, which is the advantage die. So instead of the white die, you roll the orange die. No white die, we're rolling this one. And this here has better odds for the superior side. It's the only die in the game that's like this. It's a special case die, okay? Uh, the only other thing is if uh, someone orders a melee charge, melee has to be ordered. Someone orders a charge. If units charge in, all units take one loss. All units take a loss. Actually, I need to update this. Every single block takes a loss, okay? All right. Uh, when you apply losses, I don't have a rule for application of losses. My general rule of thumb is every four blocks in a fight, one loss should be applied to the block. So uh, four blocks take one loss. Something gets reduced. Uh, that's how I work that. Okay. I don't think I have that on there, do I? I might not have that one on there. Let me take a look at losses. Retreat. Oh, uh, yeah, I do have there. I do have it on there. The number of losses should conform to a logical number. 25% is a good baseline. The reason I don't have that spelled out more explicitly, I do have it in the rules. Uh, it's just it's going to vary. It's just going to vary because the amount of losses inflicted on an opponent depends on, you know, how big is the engagement. I didn't want a blanket rule because some engagements are these little tiny. You have one battalion against another battalion. Other times you have a whole darn battle line firing out other, another battle line. So in the battalion on battalion engagement, it doesn't make sense to make both blocks take losses or all four take losses, unless they're in a melee. Uh, on the other hand, a big, huge battle line engagement, it doesn't make sense to reduce only one block out of the whole battle line. So, you, you know, I just figure about 25% of those blocks should take some kind of a, a distinct loss. People have to understand that Napoleonic warfare was not as bloody as people assume. When we think Napoleonic warfare, we think Waterloo. We think um, Austerlitz or whatever. Uh, we think about all these great battles where there were massive casualties. Well, that's because both sides were going all in. They pushed all their men into the middle and fought with each other because it was meant to be a decisive engagement. But the typical engagement for during the Napoleonic Wars, also during the American Civil War, were these much smaller skirmishes that happened almost on a daily basis, especially in the American Civil War. And you might have a dozen casualties on one side or another. They were not these bloody fights. Not every battle was the Battle of Antietam or the Battle of Gettysburg. You know, those get all the attention. But the typical everyday combat, you were more likely to die from disease than you were from getting shot. So I don't want combat that's too bloody. That's why the rules are the way they are, and they're deliberately vague in that category. If I get a lot of complaints or pushback on that, I might kind of codify that a little differently. But for now, it should be adequate. Again, as an umpire, use your judgment. Okay. Um... Remember, these, the, 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 the groups are going to vary in terms of combat value. So it's going to be pretty easy. When you total up the combat value, you're going to know, oh, I roll the white die, I roll the orange die. It's actually not a hard thing to calculate. Uh, but we got to talk about artillery. Okay? I apologize. I know this is a brain full already. I know everyone's brains are already full. But I got to get this out for the per sake of the recording. Okay. All right. Here's a good way to think about this. 
a full battery is two of these blocks. Two of these blocks equals a battery. And this is the same as this. You can even count them up. You know, let's go to a little open space here. This is the same as this. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and eight. Okay, all right. Uh, there are some bonuses depending on the type of battery. We won't worry about that now. When the players tell you, hey, this is a 12 pound gun, you can right click, you can click on the name, and you type in 12 pound or whatever. And then when you hover your mouse over it, it tells you it's a 12 pound gun. Uh, whatever. Okay? Whatever it takes to keep track. In any case, um, the more guns there are in a battery, the more die roll modifiers they get. Okay, so guns equals DRMs. DRMs. Okay, that's important to remember. Artillery gives DRMs. So that's really cool when you're rolling one of these dice, like you're rolling the white die and it's kind of even odds I don't want even odds when I fight I want artillery to support my combat and give me DRMs because that's what's going to tilt the balance in my favor so um, what you want to do is uh, have your artillery fire in support of infantry combat in fact the player does not get a choice if the infantry is present with the artillery, the artillery always supports the infantry because that's its job. And you will simply add DRMs for every section that exists in the battery. Okay, so if you see this, okay, one, two, three, four DRM. Now, if artillery takes a loss, you take one of these and you replace it with one of these. That artillery bad. That's an artillery battery with one loss. Takes another loss. Oh, now you're down to a half battery. Okay. Takes another loss. Now you're down to just the gun section. Okay. So that's how that works. When it operates in conjunction with infantry, it gives you a plus one DRM to the combat. Okay. Uh, or a plus up to a plus four. All right. So let's just do a quick little exercise here. Uh, I have this formation here, and they're going to fight this formation here. Let's assume all units are regular. Uh, how do I resolve that combat? Uh, one white die with a plus, plus uh, one die, DRM for the blue. That's correct. That's correct. We're just assuming oh. they're, they're in range. Uh, 400 paces so there you go yeah that's correct you're gonna roll one the white die and you're gonna roll it with a plus one DRM for blue okay and that's it um, okay so let's say let's say I have a battery and it is situated on this hill and dumb old red has come into range of that battery okay this battery is going to fire on this unit here. How do I resolve that? Anyone know off the top of their head? Is it the black? That's right. You're going to roll what's called the black unopposed artillery die. All right. So the black die is your unopposed arty die. And you roll that when the artillery is firing at a target that cannot shoot back. Now that is for these situations where there's a little bit of range between them. This here, you, you're not going to roll the black die here in this situation. And the reason is because the artillery is busy supporting the infantry. But if you end up in a situ situation where the artillery is just kind of doing its own thing and they take infantry under fire or cavalry under fire, then you're going to go ahead and roll the unopposed arty die. And it is exactly what it says there. Okay. Now, here's the rule. Here's where it gets a little tricky with artillery. You bust out with your big ruler here. Mm. Actually, I don't think it says it on here. That's another thing we need to do. That's something we need to change on that ruler. Uh, let's see here. If 
does it say on this here? No, no, no. That's the movement ruler, so it doesn't say on that. Um, where does it say it? Okay, I know I have it in the cheat sheet, but I it really kind of needs to be here somewhere. Well, the cheat sheet technically counts, but okay. When firing the unopposed arty die, uh, depending on what gun you're firing, the only difference is the is the the range. So the six to seven pound gun shoots to 1800 paces the 10 12 pound gun shoots to 2000 paces outside of that at 400 paces or less you're going to roll two dice and you're going to apply both results okay in other words both of these dice are going to apply a result okay so this here is when they're really close and they're you're firing canister at them or grape shot or whatever target falls back okay so target will fall back they'll fall back twice meaning they're going to fall back 400 paces you want to make that a retreat that's fine make it a retreat put disruption on it whatever you want to do if you think this is too mild a result go ahead and, and you know bump it up a little you know don't make it easy for red red did something dumb they they marched straight into the face of guns on a hill they're lucky they only had to fall back. Is there a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so what's the difference between getting a 5 and a 2? Target falls back, no effect. And if I got a 5 and a 5, 2 target falls back. You would stack both effects. So obviously 5 and a 2, target falls back, they're going to fall back 200 paces. Then you go to the next die and it's no effect, so you're done. If it if it's a five and a five and it's fall back and fall back, then you go ahead and apply both. And now, so I would. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, they'd fall back uh, 400 paces. And you would put uh, two disruption on each block. Technically, fall back. They don't take disruption. But okay. you know, I'm sitting here looking at this. You're sitting here looking at this. The viewers are sitting here looking at this, saying, "Yeah, it seems like a like they got off a little too lightly." Okay upgrade the result give them a loss give them a disruption at least yeah absolutely so just take this disruption and put it on there again as an umpire one of your jobs this is literally your job as an umpire this is why we don't trust this to an artificial intelligence and go play um what's that new game that came out with fire and maneuver or whatever um <laughs> is because you're going to look at this and say, no, nah, you know what, that's that's really not an appropriate result. It, it, should have been, it should be a lot harsher for red. And upgrade, change the result. Change it. Say, all right, you know what? Exercise of discretion. Exactly. This, You know what, this unit takes a loss. I'm sorry. I'm not going to let them get, get away with doing something that crazy so easily. So they're, I'm going to put a loss on them. And you do it. I want people to feel comfortable doing that because that's why Kriegspiel is umpired. You know? Well, now, I guess we figured out what you know, Marshall's fudge recipe is. That's right. <laughs> that's the fudge recipe. Absolutely. Because that's what an umpire does. An umpire looks at it and says, you know what? I'm going to kind of make an executive decision here. The only rule with doing this is you have to be able to justify it to the players I would also say there's another rule in that you have to kind of be consistent, right? Don't just be doing this to one side because you like the color blue, you know? <laughs> um, you know, be consistent. As an umpire, you're expected to be at that kind of next level, right? And exercise uh, good discretion and such. Uh, okay, the other one is counter battery. I have a personal problem with people who do counter battery all the time. Oh, oh yeah, let's do counter battery, counter battery, counter battery. Uh, my dog, you can hear her in the background doing counter battery with the puppy. She, she's a senior dog and the puppy, well, he's a puppy. Um, quick question before you move to counter battery. Yeah. Uh, if the DRM were equal to both sides. Uh-huh. There's no let's DRM. Say then there's just no DRM? Because, like, for example, if both of those infantry uh, units earlier had equal amount of artillery supporting them, then it would just be straight. That's right. It would just be a straight roll of the white die or whatever. Yeah, it would be a straight roll. Okay. 
Yeah, it's going to happen. Thank you. It, it can also happen that the superior side has negative DRMs. So uh, I'll set that up just to illustrate real quick. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's see here. Let's see. Let's. Uh, here is the defending side. Uh, how was I going to do this? Oh, I can't remember how I was going to do my own exercise. Great. Okay. So defending side has um, this Wait. hill, and they have. Uh, let's let's give them a, a section of guns, and let's just we can stack them, you know, whatever to arrange it. Okay. And then here's the attackers, and the attackers are here, and the attackers actually have superior combat value, right? So we've got five, five, five. 15 plus 4, 19 combat value. Here we have 5 and 5, 10 combat value. Red is clearly superior. So they're going to roll the advantage die because they have greater than 2 combat value versus the blue. Okay, and again, that's on the face of the die. You can read the rule right there. Okay, however, blue has a bunch of modifiers. They are on a hill. Uh, they've got a half battery, so that's two. So that's one, two, three uh, DRM. I might even want to give them a fourth DRM. So even though red is coming in and they're going to close, they're going to come to this range. They're going to come to the bottom of the hill and start shooting. And they're going to have this exchange of fire. Blue has more DRMs. So I'm going to roll this die and I'm going to apply a negative three DRM. And I can only go down to one. They're routed. So even though they're superior and they got to roll the advantage die, they got routed because of the DRMs. So that, that totally happens where the superior side ends up with negative DRMs because the defenders, even though they're outnumbered, are in a superior position. Things like that. They have more, more support. Yes. Um, Marshall, I've got, I've got a couple of questions about uh, about artillery. So I might I might have missed this. Um, so does, does the artillery add any combat value to that calculation, or they added a uh, die roll modifier, not combat? But just value. the roll, but, but not a not a, a CV for the purposes of like superior inferior. Exactly correct. Gotcha. gotcha. Correct. And um, when when you were doing this for demonstration of artillery firing on an uh, you know on, an, on a unit who couldn't fire back, um, is it so that's that you roll one dice for for each of the sort of full full blocks of artillery oh, you've got, right? I didn't finish that. <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's on the cheese sheet. I'm I'm trying I'm trying to finish here on time. We've just got ten minutes left. Um, yeah, yeah. One more. Uh, let's see here. Oh, it's right there. Okay, right here. When firing the unopposed arty die at four hundred paces or less, you roll two dice. Apply both results. Between four hundred and eight hundred paces, roll two dice. Apply the greatest result. Between 800 and 1,200 places, roll one die and apply the result. And between 12 and 1,600 paces, roll two dice, apply the least result. Why is that? Well, it softens the odds that you're going to get a harsh result at greater range. So between 12 and 1,600 paces, I'm going to roll two dice. One of those dice might be, oh my gosh, you're completely blown up. But the other one might be no effect. Well, at between 12 and 1600 paces, the artillery fire is not as accurate. We're going to take the no effect result and apply that one. Uh, we get a little closer. It's a straight roll. You get what you get. Closer than that, we're going to roll two dice and we're going to apply the higher of the two results. And at 400 paces or less, you're just staring down the barrel of the gun. They can't miss you at that range. You're going to get both results. So the number of dice that you roll is uh, part of the range. That's the difference that range makes. At closer range, you're going to roll more dice and get more effects than you do at longer range. I, I should say the number of effects that apply to you is technically correct because you also apply, you also roll two dice at, at long range. So it's the number of effects and the nature of the effects that get applied to you that's the difference. Anyway, that's why it's on the cheat sheet. You don't have to remember it. You just have to know I'm going to look at this cheat sheet to determine how to resolve it. Okay. Uh, counter battery fire. Again, I'm not a huge fan of counter battery fire. The odds of scoring a hit in counter battery fire are kind of low. 
Uh, you only score a hit on 8, 9, and 10. This is a hit. When there's a hit, you simply exchange the piece to indicate that the gun has taken a loss, or that the battery, or half battery in this case here, has taken a loss. So the battery's taken a loss. That half battery is now replaced by a section, so I now have a half battery and a section still firing. Okay, and that's how that works. Both sides roll the die. Both sides. This is one of those cases where both sides will roll their own die because they are both firing counter battery. There was really no way to, I mean, I could if I wanted to uh, come up with a mechanic, but I think it's just fun to give them both there. Oh, that's the F. I need to hit the R. Okay, so miss and a miss. Misses are very common on counter battery fire, and again, part of that is my personal bias. I think that artillery needs to be firing on maneuver elements of the enemy force. They should not just sit there and duel with each other. They should be firing on infantry, for goodness sake. That's why they exist, you know. Uh, but commanders have this strong temptation to always fire on uh, other batteries. And no, no, uh, this discourages that, okay? So each time they take a hit, uh, the number of sections in the battery determines the die roll modifier when they're firing in support, right? Okay, things like that. So that's pretty straightforward. I don't think I have to go more into that. The only thing I haven't got into here is cavalry. And cavalry is simple. Uh, there's two dice. There's cavalry versus cavalry and cavalry versus infantry. Here's cav versus cav. Use with the cav chart. Here's cavalry versus infantry. And cavalry versus infantry really comes down to are they in square or not. I would also add to this. If somebody decides to charge a line from the front, that's not going to go so well for the cavalry. And that's the one exception to this die I would start making, is if you charge with your cavalry, so let's get some cavalry. We're going to get some hussars because hussars have that reputation. And they're going to charge this French unit or this blue unit from the front. Okay. Well, if they're going to do that, I would I would give them the same bonus as if they're in square. Because this is just a dumb thing to do. I'm not going to reward the cavalry for doing a dumb thing. I'm going to punish that. Okay? On the other hand, if uh, they're not in square, then... Sorry, I had to sneeze for a second. I apologize. Uh, all right. Um, uh, let's see here. I'm sneezing on camera. That's great. Um, <laughs> so it's an historical moment. It is right? Cap captured forever. <laughs> um, um, if, uh, uh, if the infantry is in square, the infantry gets a plus three DRM. If they're not, then the cavalry gets a plus two, depending on the type. So if they're Hustlers or Dragoons, they get a plus two. If they're Lancers or Curassiers, they get a plus three to their roll. So generally, the way this works, unless you get a fluke result, most of the time, being in square or not is going to be decisive for this interaction between cavalry and infantry. Otherwise, a... you just oh. take a look at this chart to tell. If I have Dragoons hitting Curassiers, the cuirassiers get a plus one. You roll cav versus cav, and it's a simple plus one, and you're done. Okay? Go is ahead. There a, is there a hasty square mechanism? Yes, there is. Um, and it's in on the cheat sheet. glad you asked. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, let's see here. Let me go here. Infantry forming squares. If no cavalry is within a thousand paces, a square is always formed when it's ordered. There's nothing to interfere with it. If the cavalry is within a thousand paces, you make a die roll. Elite always succeeds. Regular, uh, it's a D10, two or greater. Militia, it's a three or greater. So it's probably going to succeed. But sometimes, you know, especially militia, they don't know what they're doing. They're just bumping into each other. If they're <laughs> taken by surprise, though, if the... Um, cavalry is charging them and they were not expecting it, they still have a chance to form square at your discretion as an umpire. 
And if not, then you roll the die to determine whether or not they succeed in doing it. If the square formation fails, they take a disruption. So there you go. Okay, uh, I've got time for one, maybe two questions maximum, and then we got to start with the regular game. Are there any questions? Uh, so artillery firing on uh, units that can't fire back. If, if the artillery has taken losses, uh, what happens then? Do you still just roll normally, or do they take a, a penalty? Yes, uh, I just roll it normally. Uh, however, if you think, you know what, these guns are kind of weak, you can apply a minus one DRM. In fact, I think the minus one DRM does apply uh, when doing that. Let me take a look. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I don't have this under... Uh, I do not have this under when firing the unopposed RD die, but I'm pretty sure that is the rule that I have. So for each gun section that a full battery is missing, I would apply a minus one DRM to it. So a full battery is going to, so a full battery, in other words, this here is going to roll the full and get the full effect of its dice. Okay. They're going to get all their, all their credit. If the gun section is reduced, or I'm sorry, if the battery is reduced, then I would reduce, I would apply a, a negative DRM. Again, uh, I don't have time to look this up and get into it because it's already eight o'clock. Um, use your, excuse me, use your discretion here. And again, even if your discretion contradicts what's written in the rule, follow your discretion. Again, the rules are guidelines. They're there to help you or to advise you. But the final decision rests with you as the umpire. If you think that a situation is too strict or too liberal, modify it according to your taste. And the only rule is that it's reasonable, it's consistent, and that you can explain it to the players. That's like three rules there. But uh, the only three rules. <laughs> okay. You're starting to sound like a Monty Python routine. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's it. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and then we're going to discuss uh, the scenario for today.